Okay, um, this one is actually summarizing uh, some of the things I have said about the link between transport costs, underpricing of, uh, of transport services, and, uh, and urban structures. So <coughs> if you don't get congestion, uh, you will get a pressure on the politicians, on the decision makers to increase road capacity. Uh, you get more capacity, uh, which increases mobility, at least in the short run, and, and until the next, next bottleneck uh, emerges. Um, mobility can, uh, can then facilitate urban sprawl, spreading of urban areas, uh, which means that the average length of the movements, the trips, increases. And the number of movements increases as well. And then you are back here and so on. So unless this is mitigated by some type of uh, road pricing measure or other types of regulations, but this has proved to be a fairly good way of regulating uh, traffic demand, it's, uh, it's very hard to break this, this circle which, as I said, has been a problem for many, many cities in, uh, in the US uh, in, in, in particular, the spreading of... Uh, but we have had even cities in Europe that may be considered as, as fairly dense, condensed, like Paris, looks like this. This is where all the tourists are... Uh, are uh, living when they visit Paris, but this is the, let's say, the big Paris, where you have the population outside of this area is 82%, uh, employment 67%, lots of uh, land is used uh, in, in this area. So it's, uh, it's one of the fastest growing areas has been uh, for uh, for quite some some years and and a lot of so and the growth is is taking place in uh, in the outskirts <coughs> and there are uh, very little type very little pricing or modest pricing in this area uh, so they don't cover these costs at all in uh, in, in Paris. It's uh, only one, one example of, this is, let's say, uh, of the bigger cities, even the European bigger cities, this is the, the usual or the a very common pattern. So, <coughs> when we are going to go into an analytical planning process, we need to sort of limit ourselves in a way to some, uh, we need to have a focus, we need to have a kind of a research question, which is uh, manageable. I mean, this is really an elephant and you need to eat it piece by piece anyway. You cannot make comprehensive plans that covers everything. So there are basically four phases, collection of data, analysis of data by means of econometrics or uh, other types of, of modeling uh, to, to provide then uh, forecasts of activity and travel and then evalu evaluate relevant alternatives in terms of, uh, let's say, how should we design projects to increase transport capacity. And this is, uh, <coughs> this is a very important step because uh, it's it's uh, highly important to not ignore good alternatives good projects that can be uh, f feasible for for solving the the problem so to speak historically it has been a tendency to jump to conclusions 
and the conclusion has in many cases been increasing road capacity. Arterial road capacity should be increased and so on. Based on pressures like this. And we have it, as I said, I think it was on the, on, on the last week's lecture, we have it here locally. Exactly this problem with a relatively small congestion problem, which, in my opinion, easily could have been priced off, but which is now used as a, an argument for uh, implementing a big, really big, relatively speaking to the size of the city, road improvement program here. They have, of course, added in some improvements for the public transport sector as well, because they need to do that for, from, for political reasons. But the main content of the transport improvement program in, in Molde has to do about with uh, expansion of road capacity. If we dig a bit further down into the, into the substance here, we are trying to model transport flows in an area to, as a basis for determining where should we expand capacity and to what extent. And uh, there are four steps. One, <coughs> first one is trip generation. How many trips will be made within a zone? And a zone can be, uh, a, that is a specific geographical area where we know the number of residents, number of citizens. We know the demographic profile, the age distribution, the employment. We know, we know uh, also in which types of industries people work. We know the car ownership per uh, household. We know th the distribution of gender, ma uh, male, female, and so on. Number of kids in the households, it, all that types of data is gathered from the National Bureau of Statistics. Then we have travel surveys, which reports how a citizen of a given characteristic, like I mentioned a woman, mid-30s, two kids living in a fairly urban area, how she is doing her transport activities during one typical day. And then we use that information <coughs> together with the statistical information that we can gather from the National Bureau of Statistics to say something about and to model, not only to say something about it, but to model uh, how many trips will be made to and from that zone. Then the next <coughs> is to determine to where will these trips go. Then we need an origin, where you start from, and a destination pattern. And that is also modeled based on um, the characteristics of the adjacent zones with, we know where the shops are, can be determined in, uh, in by means of data from, uh, from the National Bureau of Statistics. So we have a kind of uh, basis for determining to where the trips will go and can model that. And this is then when the, where the transport system comes into consideration because it, al it is also a story about transport costs. Because if you have a shop there and a shop there and the person is living here, they will go to the shop which has the lowest transport costs in between. So the model will shift the tra traffic to the to the place to the attraction. It may be a shop. It may be a a workplace <coughs> where 
where it is uh, where the transport costs are lowest. And the third, when we have determined the number of trips, trips distribution is the model split. What kind of transport mode will be used for the trip? And then we have them in the, in the models, we have a very detailed description of transport costs per mode. So then um, we use different uh, functional shapes to determine whether people will choose between using their own car or using a bus or using a train or a light, light train, if that is available, to get between A and B, original destination. And then finally, what kind of routes would be used for the trips, which is again a question of transport costs. Because you can go from A to B, but there can be different roads, different routes to choose from. And this is a very complex uh, transport uh, or network model problem. And um, those such models are developed for, for the whole of Norway. And they use them also in, uh, in, in most countries, in, uh, in at least in Europe and also in the US. But then the models for the Norwegian transport sector is developed here at this college and uh, together with the Institute of Transport Economics in Oslo. So when, when, uh, when the model is sort of developed and we have the data, we, we run the model and then we compare what the model is giving. And the model gives transport flows for every road, public transport flo flows for every route. And then we can compare the model results with the actual situation. Because we can count the number of cars, we can count the number of passengers on a given bus route, and we can compare that with the model results. <coughs> and for those of you in, uh, who are interested, I can give you some, some reports, but the comparisons are very good in terms of that the model is uh, predicting the actual traffic very in a very nice way, I would say. The deviations are not very large, so they work quite well. And the idea is then to say, what will be the impact of all these four factors if we change the shape of the network? If we, if we improve the road capacity, we or we if we establish a new link in the network, or if we increase the departure frequency of, of the bus services, we can use the models to predict what will happen. And we can also use them for simulation. Say, if we have, I can take the next picture here. This is, uh, this is a picture of uh, Amsterdam, the capital in the Netherlands. And this is actually uh, a transport model that is used to predict the uh, transport flows. This is the arterial network around the city center. And this is the roads leading into the core, which is here. And the thickness of the lines gives the amount of traffic. So what we can do, <coughs> we can start to, to, to simulate events like, for instance, closing a road. Clo let's say that there are some severe noise problems uh, in this area. So we need to reduce the level of traffic now so, so we can close this road. What will then happen? Then the model reroutes the traffic. And we are can be able to say something about bottlenecks in other parts of the network. and. Uh, and uh, we can identify such strong increases in costs and uh, also the needs for, uh, for pricing, congestion pricing. But, uh, but perhaps the most interesting feature in, in uh, terms of the main uh, topic for this course is that we can simulate what if we establish a residential area in this place. 
with uh, let's say uh, 50,000 people we can design a new satellite or suburb with 50,000 people here and they are uh, populated with uh, citizens of a specific uh, we know the characteristics fairly well mostly people in the in the 30s 40s with kids and cars and we can say something about what if we don't establish a, a, a subway or a bus route and we establish a suburb with 50,000 people what will happen to the traffic and the bottlenecks if we uh, construct a separate busway or a, or a subway what will happen to the traffic flows and uh, and the total trans transport costs in this network so this is uh, what we do in practice when we try to analyze let's say location effects if we are going to establish a new new uh, suburbs somewhere and this is not this is not only something that i make up because there are lots of examples of urban planning where new suburbs have actually been designed and implemented. Oslo, the small capital of Norway, is full of such examples. This is a more local example of using transport models. Uh, it's a map. As you can see, we are here now. This is where the college is located. And this is three scenarios for the crossing of this fjord. This is a scenario where the crossing is, uh, is located uh, in the outer part of the fjord. This is a, a solution with the, look with the crossing just outside here and this is a solution where the crossing is planned in that direction and this is uh, this is of course not built infrastructure but it is simulated when we just in the model links these two net these existing networks with a new highway with certain characteristics and then you can see this is these numbers are number of cars per day for 24 hours and we can use this simulation to say something about uh, traffic numbers we can use it for capacity planning and uh, and we can uh, we can use them to say something about the which one of these three alternatives gives the highest return on invested capital. And then we can also say that if we are going to build something like this, we need to charge the users with a rather high road toll, around 200 Norwegian kroner each way. What will be the impact on the traffic? if we do that. That can be also uh, addressed in these models. And this is, uh, to my, uh, in my mind, it's, it's next to strange, it's very strange that the funding of this type of projects are not discussed when they are proposed for political decisions. Funding is not a part of the discussion, at least not when it comes to project selection. When the project is decided, then, they then the decision maker starts to fight for money. And if they, ne if they need to put uh, a lot of pressure on the, on the users, because this is not systems that have capacity problems. This is systems where we levy tolls for just funding reasons. 
that the traffic will be, s be, will be strong re strongly reduced. And then the nice effects that we really want to achieve, namely to connect two economic systems together, because here is Molde, and this is Olesund, the city down south here, and to connect these systems together to perhaps achieve something interesting in terms of uh, productivity effects will be very much, let's say, reduced. Those possibilities will be very much reduced if you charge uh, extensively, ex extensively for the use of this, uh, this, this road. I will come back to that, uh, what kind of productivity effects I'm talking about. We can take it a step further. This is the same three areas, the same three alternatives. The outer alternative, the mid alternative, and the eastern alternative, which crosses here. And the shade of this, the, this, the, the colors here, the dark colors, gives the zones where you get the highest benefits to the citizens. So if you talk about planning and if you are occupied with the distribution of benefits to the society, how it distributes itself geographically, you can use a uh, combination of transport models and maps like this to illustrate to the decision makers. And in the case where you cross here, this, this island will get quite a lot of benefits. And they are very much in favor of this eastern alternative, of course. But the uh, one that is on the, on the board right now is this one. This crosses here. And this is this yes. Uh, just a question about capacity pricing. Uh, is there any capacity priced uh, road in Norway right now, or is it only um, uh, pricing for the um, uh, funding? I would say no. There are some differentiated pricing in uh, Trondheim where it's, uh, it's free to go in the evenings, during night time, and during the weekends. And it's a very low f t uh, charge during the workday, as compared to what it perhaps should have been, according to this, uh, this illustration. In Oslo, there are no variation. It's a flat rate all, uh, all through the day and night and weekends. And the same, I think, it's in Bergen. Uh, so, uh, so this has not been used uh, extensively. Uh, Oslo is discussing it. And then those who are against this, they say that uh, if you impose this system, the government or the public, uh, the um, road authorities and the government will get much more of revenues from the motorists. But that is not true because we have studied that and we have modeled <coughs> a system with capacity pricing in the three bigger cities, Trondheim, Bergen and Oslo. And uh, as far as I remember, in Oslo, you will lose money on that. The, re the revenues to the state or to the government will go down because as compared with today, where you have a flat tax all over the, all over the, the day, uh, there will be taxes during morning and afternoon, a small rate during daytime, and nothing during nighttime, week uh, weekends and evenings. So this this is a it very uh, this scheme 
invites to have differentiated pricing during the day. This is peak, this is off peak. Whereas the systems that are imposed for, uh, for uh, funding, they are have a flat rate all, all through the day. I think Trondheim got a, an increase, increase in, uh, in uh, revenues from a differentiated scheme because they have already free passage outside of the peak hours. Whereas Oslo and Bergen, they actually lost revenue because of this. Well, has it been implemented uh, anywhere else? In L London. Is there any results of it? London. London. Yeah. Stockholm. Singapore. Has it. London has a quite, uh, quite uh, extensive pricing scheme. Stockholm uh, implemented theirs in, uh, I think it was in 2008. And there was a large resistance among the public uh, opinion in general. So uh, they implemented it and they promised that there should be a referendum after two or three years. But it worked so well because, the, because of this small reduction in, in, uh, in, uh, in traffic during peak hours. The flow was very much improved. Uh, and um, the referendum, contrary to all the expectations that were around, were, was very much in favor of continuing with this scheme. So they have it still. Oslo has discussed it for years. But since Norway is a rich country, they choose to build more roads than uh, pricing, efficient, than implementing efficient pricing. That's my small hypothesis on that. <laughs> Perhaps it will <coughs> turn out differently when, when we get a downturn in the business cycles, which will come, I think, uh, so sooner or later. This is a checklist. I will not go through that in, uh, in, uh, in detail, but it is... Uh, um listing some economic development factors or impacts of, uh, of transport. And uh, we can focus on, on a few, like uh, the most common one is transport system efficiency, transport project cost efficiency. The definition, what we mean by these terms, whether the transport facility investment repay costs and optimize value, rates of benefits to costs. Then we have the evaluation methods, benefit cost models, and then the strategies that we should, should choose given that the projects are, uh, are feasible, to choose projects with high return on invested capital. And for the system efficiency, do as I have told you now, use efficient pricing and policies that favor higher value trips and of course reduces the congestion problems. But there are other factors as well which needs to sort of be understood as I have told you at the outset, beginning of the lecture. There may be aspects for instance connected to basic access and this is in urban areas. But I'm now working with um, I'm working with um, air transport in regional uh, in the in in the in smaller Norwegian regions, and those systems are not very well, uh, let's say, adapted to project cost efficiency. They are very expensive to run. And uh, there is always a discussion of whether they should be closed down. And if you assess those regional air transport services from this element alone, you will end up closing them down. But then you go need to go to s some other more, let's say, which are more like constraints to the analysis. 
like this one. If there is a political agreement that people should have a kind of a basic access from where they live, where they live, and to let's say the the main capital or or the main regional center, you can say that, for instance, they should be able to go on a day trip to a meeting in Oslo and back again the same day. Let's say that they should be in able to visit the city center between 10 a.m and 3 p.m., five hours. Then you can uh, supplement or inform the decision makers that, well, this is not good for this uh, route, but if you close it down, you violate some political principles or basic access. And then the next step will then be to optimize the services given that you have a constraint of, let's say, in this case, basic access. Is then the current route efficient in terms of fulfilling this, this constraint that you should have basic access? And then you can start analyzing that if the route is serving basic access in an efficient way. So there are various steps here. You can take that as, a, as, as one separate objective in, let's say, densely populated areas where accessibility is not a problem. Everybody has the access to the city center. But in other parts of, of a country, you need to let's say, optimize system efficiency under a constraint like ba basic access. And there are some other aspects here as well which may be, uh, be of interest. Not all of them are of interest in every type of project. But you may have, for instance, a special interest in, uh, in, uh, in retail and tourism in one area, and then you can expand a cost-benefit analysis with an input-output study to say how will this actually affect the local tourist industry. So it's a menu, and you should understand when you should pick the right items for your, let's say, your specific program or project that should be, should be assessed. All right. I think I will <coughs> stop there. There are some, um, some pitfalls. I can just mention this list. Uh, and I want just to stop with a comment on this one. Confusion between ends and means. And that is a very common mistake that is made in, in, uh, in when we plan specific projects. I can give you one example which can, uh, can uh, illustrate the problem. I was uh, engaged in a, in a project some years ago uh, connected to, to noise from air transport, from the main airport in Oslo. Because there were some parts of the surroundings which were annoyed by, uh, by uh, aircraft noise. And then Can we you? were presented a project with a with a main objective, and the main objective was formulated like: we should choose the right corridor for the aircraft to take off to reduce noise levels. Choose the right corridor for the aircraft to take off to reduce the noise problems for the, for the surroundings. This is typical confusion. 
between goals and objectives. Because what you should have had as a goal is that you should reduce aircraft noise with a certain amount, let's say 5 dBA or uh, some, some measure on that. Because then you can choose between choosing the right corridors. You can even let the aircraft fly as they do today. But you can do something with, uh, with the housing, the insulation for, uh, for noise. Uh, you can do something with the location of new, uh, new housing, building of new houses. And you have a menu of actions that you can take. When you, s when you specify the goal as reducing the noise. But if you say that we should avoid, let's say, the aircraft to fly in a specific direction, you are limiting, let's say, the choice set that you have to, to do something with the problem, which is aircraft noise, not necessarily the way the, the, the airport or the aircraft operate. So to be very careful when you when we formulate uh, the, r the right objectives. Because to avoid the limiting the choice set of projects that you can have to, to do something with, uh, with the underlying pro problem, which the objective should actually address. I think you can read the rest. I will post the uh, lecture notes uh, after the, uh, tonight. And, uh, then we meet again for uh, the Weber and Hoteling location theory next week. Okay.